Good morning, everybody. I'm Jason Pittman. I'm the pastor of the Sepulga Charge, which is Jenkins Chapel, Bethel, and Asbury United Methodist Church. And I'd like to welcome y'all to another week. Uh, we are going to post this on YouTube and Facebook, and uh, hopefully we'll be back in church soon, and everyone is invited uh, as well. So uh, anyway, without further ado, we're going to have the uh, children's sermon starting with Samantha Pittman, and I'll welcome her right over here, and she will give today's children's sermon. Acts 1 verse 9. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. I'm sure you know that one filled with helium, a balloon floats in the air. And it's also quite enjoyable when it does float away from you. It's fun to stand and watch as the balloon floats higher and higher into the heavens until it totally disappears. The only way to experience that is to be willing to let it go. In today's Bible lesson in the book, book of Acts, we learn that when Jesus was ready to return to heaven, he took his disciples aside and made sure that they understood everything that, they, that had happened to him. He explained why it was important for him to be crucified and it raised and to be raised from the dead to fulfill what the scriptures had said about him. He also told them that he was going to return to his father in heaven and that the Holy Spirit would come to be with them. At first the disciples were sad that Jesus would be leaving them, but then the Bible tells us that Jesus opened Jesus opened their minds so that they would understand. Then an amazing thing happened. The Bible tells us that Jesus lifted his hands and blessed his disciples. While he was blessing them, he lifted up and was taken up into heaven, up, up, and away. I don't know how all of this, all of this looked, but in my imagination, I can see the disciples standing and watching as Jesus ascended higher and higher until he disappeared from view. Were the disciples sad? No way. The Bible tells us that when Jesus had gone up into heaven, the disciples worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They stayed continually in, in the temple praising God. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus, your only son, to die for our sin. We know that he is risen from the dead and has returned to heaven. Bless us today as we worship him with great joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Samantha. Put my eyes on here. You know, this week was uh, definitely a learning week, a challenging week, uh, and we all go through it, you know, day in and day out. Many of us uh, have so many different issues. We go through things where, you know, maybe we have addictions we're going through, uh, maybe losses in our family or friends. Um, see so many challenges in life we each have our own uh, but we're not alone and God is there to uh, to guide us he knows our every step he's known that since he created everything so uh, that being said um, hopefully today's sermon will be a good life lesson so we'll start out with the Apostles Creed and uh, feel free to recite it with me if you know it let us pray I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, amidst all that and everything I said, um, one thing you can rest assured of is our Redeemer lives. We go to Job 19, verses 25 through 27 for this. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last, and after my body is decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. 
Isn't that an amazing statement, considering most of us know who Job is and what he went through? He's an interesting and somewhat mysterious character in the Bible. And most Bible readers are familiar with Job and the great trials that he faced throughout all his life. But a lot is not known about his background. I mean, we know he lost his health. Uh, he lost his family. He lost so many things and had so many challenges. He's believed to live around the time of Abraham. And the book of Job was possibly first written, uh, the f first written portion of Scripture. The book opens with a description of Job being from the land of us. And he was a man who walked upright, he feared God, and he sought to avoid evil. And as we're introduced to Job, we immediately discover a man who was committed to the Lord. He was very committed. He was very faithful to the Lord, no matter what. Uh, some of his friends actually thought he had it made in some ways. Uh, he had uh, favor with the Lord. So a lot of times when we consider Job, uh, the emphasis is placed on his suffering, though. And no doubt, Job has, and his story uh, has brought a lot of comfort and uh, a lot of inspiration to us who have gone through a, l a lot of things in life. Um, it's brought a lot of hope to many uh, all through the ages since then uh, who face trials and adversity in life like we are right now. Um, his integrity and his commitment during a season of great loss is really to be admired and also imitated by those who walk with the Lord. Um, I want to remind you what I just said, though. It was a season. It was just a time, a window of time that he went through this. And no matter what you're going through right now, God is going to, going to find you and find your way out of it. There's always a way out, and God is going to guide your, your steps. Uh, now is not the time to lose faith. Now is the time to push even harder. Now, I know sometimes we all want to give up, but I promise you now is not the time. God has you in this. Uh, and I can tell you, I've also received a lot of uh, comfort and guidance in this story. I've read it uh, quite a few times, and uh, it's very inspirational and uh, quite possibly maybe the greatest passage in the entire Bible when it comes to life, its trials, and God absolutely getting us through everything and showing us what he can do with something bad. He can make it into good. As we read uh, this book, uh, Job he had many questions he was unable to answer, um, and, and that's quite possibly where we're at as well with God in a lot of these things, you know, why God, why? Uh, I sometimes question that as well, being a human being, but that being said, uh, God is God, and he is greater than us, and if we had all the answers, then we would be on his level, but we aren't. We're on a human level, and God is on a level well above us. God is awesome. He was dealing with, like I said, a season of great loss and great uncertainty. But in the midst of his pain, Job, he remained faithful with the Lord he served in a relationship that he shared with him. And this passage is the key to Job's survival uh, during this hor horrific trial in his life. His awareness of the Lord should, should also serve a reminder to us all uh, as believers that, that it should bring us hope, bring us comfort, even in the midst of our greatest trials. As we talk about the, the certainties in Job's life during a difficult season, I wanna consider this profound statement in this whole thing. I know my Redeemer lives. Job knew the Redeemer, because in 20, uh, verse 25 he says, for I know that my Redeemer liveth. We haven't discussed the context of the passage, but this profound statement followed a long discussion that Job had with his friends and they supposedly came to comfort him during all his trials. It was unfortunate for Job that they didn't offer much comfort at all. They wanted to convince Job that there must have been sin in his life, that he deserved all of this uh, for all the losses that he went through, and this isn't the case. They believed that God was punishing Job. Uh, he needed to repent and return to God. So, you know, they believed in this system where God punishes you if you do wrong. Um, and reading the book of Job, we know that God actually permitted Satan to attack Job. And I think that's also a profound statement. Uh, God is so great, Satan had to ask permission. Uh, he can't just up and do it. If God doesn't want it to happen, he won't allow it. But he allows things for a reason. And these reasons may not be known to us, but ultimately it will get us through. And not only will it get us through when we come out on the end of this and see the light, I promise you we will have more 
than we started with. You will see God's greatness at the end of this. You got to hold faith. You got to push forward. He lost his family. He lost his wealth and had a second attack. He lost his health. And from an outside perspective, basically, he lost it all. He lost his, his life and, and lay, lay in ruins. Uh, I'm sure he wondered why all this was happening to him. I'm sure a lot of us wonder why these things happened to us. Uh, he questioned all these events in his life. Uh, wasn't a whole lot he didn't understand or know, but he was certain of one thing. He knew the Lord. He had a personal relationship with God. Like I said earlier, he, he uh, feared the Lord. I don't mean scared of him. I mean he understood that he had to bow his knees before God. He had to pray to God. He had to have that relationship with God. So he had lost so much that pertained to his physical life, his human life, but he hadn't lost his relationship with God. And I was looking over this passage. I, I realized not only did Job know the Redeemer, the Redeemer knew him. God knew him well. Uh, let's look at the words of God in Job 1.8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him on earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and shies away from evil. Job was very unaware of this conversation. I can't imagine if, if, uh, if he knew it, what, what he would think. Uh, he had no idea what was about to happen in his life. And prior to all of that, uh, the Lord was mindful of Job and the life he lived. Those who are in Christ not only know the Lord, we are known of him. He's aware of our lives and he's mindful of us. John 10 verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. 2 Timothy 2 verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Job knew that the Redeemer lived. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. This may not have meant much to the friends who questioned Job in his integrity. Their lives had not suffered such loss. They hadn't been through what he'd been through. They were not in dire straits. However, the single statement sums up the commitment and the focus of Job at this particular moment in his life. He may have lost it all, and he, he didn't even probably have a clue where his life was headed at this point. But at this point in his life, he would have to start over. Have you been there? It's tough. He didn't know a whole lot at this moment, but he knew for certain that his Redeemer lived. His hope wasn't made in the idol made out of men's hands, one that had no power. He didn't worship a monument that, that had, had no ability to see, had no ability to hear, had no ability to move in his situation. He knew the Lord God Almighty, one that could help him through his trials, and he continued with his faith no matter what. He knew that he was just a man, and God was the God of everything. He served the eternal, eternal omnipotent Lord, his God was aware of his situation. He was alive and well, able to meet whatever need Job faced. Life had not been kind to Job in recent days, but his misfortune had not altered in the existence or the power of the God that he served. God was still in control. And guess what? Throughout everything you're going through, God is still in control. And that's where your faith has to be to get you through these moments. I don't know of anyone who suffered like Job. But we all face difficulty and pain. We all suffer loss from time to time and we're forced to deal with the uncertainty that lies ahead. We can't know what tomorrow may bring. God does, but we can know who holds tomorrow. We're not serving idols made of hands. We serve the living Lord. He endured the most horrific treatment man could possibly ever face, and that's an example for us all. We have never been through what Job has been through. He was falsely accused. He was condemned to death for crimes he had not committed. He was scourged and beaten beyond recognition by sinful men. He was crucified on a Roman cross where he bled and he died. God did that for us. All of this was as it had to be. Jesus endured all of that for you and me. He willingly died in our place. He bared the sin and the judgment that we all deserve. Jesus became sin and he tasted death so we could escape the righteous judgment of God for our sin. He laid down his life to purchase our redemption. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and yet death couldn't even hold him. Jesus came forth triumphant over death, 
sin, and hell. He ascended back to the Father where he seated today making intercession for us all. We have the privilege to enter the throne of grace. And that makes our request known to the one who conquered death and rose again in triumph at life. When we're suffering and pain comes our way, we can rest in the fact that our Redeemer lives. He's alive and well today. He's able to provide for our every need that we face, just like he did for Job. And because he lives, there are those who are saved by grace and have the, the promise of eternal life in him. Because he lives, we also have life, and that's beyond this earth. So Job also knew that the Redeemer would come. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon earth. We know with certainty that Job lived many years before the first advent of Christ. He lived prior to Jesus dying on the cross to atone for our sin, rising triumphantly from the dead, and ascending back to the Father with a promise to come again. However, Job lived with the certainty that the Lord would come and stand upon the earth. It's impossible for us to know if Job spoke of the first advent or the second coming of Christ, but his confidence in the Lord appearing is evident in everything he said. So some also may consider Job and not see much significance in his faith that the Lord will come, but it reveals a perspective that Job had in his trials. Life had been difficult. He suffered and he lost a lot. But his hope was not confined to just this life alone. He knew there was more beyond that. He was looking ahead by faith to the time when the Lord would come in righteousness and restoring what sin had lost and bringing peace to the earth. Job revealed the hope and the assurance that he had in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I know life is going to have its share of hardship and pain. And nobody that lives in this life is going to escape adversity. We face our own mortality sometime either in the middle or at the end, especially at the end. If our hope rested in this life alone, I'm pretty sure most of us will have a miserable existence. However, like Job, we can rejoice in knowing that our Lord will come again. He came the first time as a sacrifice for our sin. He's going to come again as the Lord and our judge. He was taken upon the clouds as he returned to the Father, but he left the promise to come again. The trials we face, they may bring a lot of heartache, a lot of pain, but we have the assurance that our Lord is going to come again for those who have been saved by his grace. John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Job knew that there was life after death. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I, I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes are behold and not another. Through my reins be consumed within me. Although Job lived long before Christ would come and conquer death, which is the end result of sin, he had hope and assurance of life beyond the grave. He was confident that he would stand in the presence of God and his eyes would behold the one he loved and served. Job knew this life was brief and death was certain. He knew that our bodies would return to the dust of the earth and yet he knew there was life in the Lord. He didn't fear death because he knew he had entered the Lord's presence following his death. And that's the cornerstone upon which our faith in Christ is built. Those who are born again in Christ, forgiven of sin and reconciled to God are promised eternal life in him. There is no other way. Unless the Lord comes again soon, we'll all experience death. While death is certain, it is certainly not the end of our existence. In fact, once believers pass through the gates of death, they experience life as never before. Job was actually theologically correct in his thoughts regarding his existence following death. Believers will see God. We will stand in his presence all throughout eternity. This body of flesh in which we dwell will return to the dust from which it was made, but will enjoy eternity with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. 
Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must be put on incorruption, and this mortal must be put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of sin is death, and the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Lastly, we know Job suffered a lot and his faith was not destroyed. In the midst of his pain, he was comforted knowing his Redeemer lived. He was confident that the Lord would come and he would enjoy the presence of the Lord beyond death. Job didn't fear death because he knew he was secure in the hands of the Lord. The statement of Job is one of the pro most profound in the scripture. Can you say, I know my Redeemer lives? Do you know Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you responded to his gracious offer of salvation through repentance and faith? If not, you can pray to him today. You can ask him for forgiveness. You can ask him to come into your heart. You can rest assured at that point that you have eternal life no matter what you're going through, no matter what's in your heart. It's an amazing thing. If you're saved by grace, we should all rejoice in the hope that we have and rest in his grace. Let us pray. Dear God, I'm asking that your grace and mercy would continue to follow me all the days of my life as you have promised in your word. Teach me to understand your ways and grant me wisdom, I pray, to live my life in a way that is pleasing and honoring to you. Thank you that you are my shepherd and how I praise you for your day-to-day -day provision and for the comfort and joy that you have brought into my life. Thank you for always being there for me to lead and to guide, to protect and to comfort, even when I fail. Thank you for your rod of discipline and your staff of comfort, which have proved to be such a solace in a time of need. Grant me your mercy and grace to live my life to the full and carry out the work and witness that you have prepared for me to do so. Refresh my soul and revive my spirits with streams in the desert and continue to pour out your bountiful grace and never failing mercy, which is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness and praise your holy name. And Lord, we thank you for the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'll wrap this up by saying this. No matter what you're going through, you're going to come out on the other side. You have purpose. You mean something. God made you for a reason. And that reason may be for you to reach out to somebody else that maybe has, has gone through what you're going through. I promise you, every single day, you will have an opportunity to shine for the Lord, to shine for God, to show your purpose of what he built you for, what he created you for. Moses didn't believe at first what God was asking him to do. He said he wasn't the man. He couldn't do it. He, he wasn't able to lead those people out of there. He couldn't even talk. He stuttered. But God showed him better. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And I promise you, you have purpose. No matter what you're going through, you can do this. You just push on. Not the time to give up. It's time to stand up for God. Amen.